a report of the work that we did uh, over in Madro. As you know, I traveled to Madro there at the end of February with Stacy Ferguson, who is the assistant director of the Pacific Islands Bible College. We support uh, Stacy and his work. He's been here and gave a report to us. Uh, I want to say towards the end of, of last year, maybe been more in the summer of last year, but that's who I traveled with uh, over there to the islands. And what you have on the, on the screen here, this is actually Madro. Uh, the Marshall Islands consists, as we'll see in a moment, of over 1,200 islands actually, and Madro is just the capital uh, island uh, of, of the Marshall Islands. And this was actually the most blind I have ever done. I've never flown over an ocean before, and I wasn't really looking forward to that. Uh, we left here, or I flew out uh, that Friday morning at 10.30, and I got to Honolulu uh, around midnight their time, and that's where I met Stacy. He was already there. Uh, I had a flight that left early from Tulsa, but then I was delayed the rest of the way out, and then coming back was even worse. Uh, I got delayed over and over again, so I didn't get in until late uh, on the way back as well. But nonetheless, this is Madro, and as we'll begin looking at here, of course, the first question we'll look at is where is it? Well, you have here in the bottom left screen, the uh, bottom left part of the map is Australia, and just really to the west of, of the Marshall Islands, which is circled there in red, you have the, the islands, the Federal States of Micronesia, then you have the Philippines uh, further to the west there, until just above New Zealand and northeast uh, of Australia, just really in the middle of, <laughs> middle of nowhere. And it consists of, as we'll see in a second, over 1,200 islands of make up the Marshall Islands. This is a more detailed picture. This is not all the islands, obviously. This is some of the, of the larger ones. Uh, United Airlines is the only one that actually will fly out to uh, Madro. You fly out from Honolulu to Madro, and they only do it, uh, I think, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you want to get out any other time, you just, you just have to wait. And so they come to Madro, then they kind of do another hip, another hop over to some other islands. And I couldn't find a, a map that I could put on the screen that showed that. But I do have a book here that we, we everyone can look at later that shows uh, the map of how they uh, fly out to the islands. And you can't see it from there, but just kind of hip hop and a jump. They fly out to Madro, then they fly over to Quagin, I think that's how you say it, and then over to, to Corsay, to Pompeii, then to Chuuk, and then they finally stop in, in Guam. So when you're flying out from Madro to Honolulu, it's already been to, to it's already left Guam, been to Chuuk, been to Pompeii, and these other islands. So when you get on the airplane, there's already people who's been on it for a while. So when you leave Madro, as I found out, uh, there's actually a host of other people there in the airport who are waiting to leave as well, hoping to get on board. So you get there early to make sure that I can get on board uh, because there's others there who have what they call a buddy pass who are trying to fly out to Honolulu. And so they're waiting to see if they're able to get on, get on the plane. But it's already, of course, every plane I was on flying out or going in uh, was packed. There was, it wasn't empty seat anywhere. And uh, you'll, if you ever flown with Islanders, if you plan to in the future, you know they don't care about where seat assignments are. I've watched every time the stores come through and reassign people to where they were, and it's quite an experience to fly with Islanders, to say the very least. But that is Madro, and these are some other of the islands that make up the Marshall Islands, and some other ones, uh, smaller ones out there as well, that many are not inhabited at all. They're just so small, there's no one out there. If you actually look at the picture here, you'll see where you have the, the island kind of curves and you have, we see kind of spots of trees. Well, that's actually at low tide. When high tide comes in, uh, it fills in and you can't get, you have to wait till it goes out or take a boat across. But when it goes out, you can actually walk across the other islands. And that's how it is in a lot of places. Where we are at, we're probably here kind of in the curve, the bottom curve is where we are at, our hotel is at. And you can see the, uh, the fishing ships and things there, uh, the, the uh, Empire of Japan, as they, as they refer to, uh, uses, uh, gives them funds to make uh, their roads and uh, bus stops and other things. In return, they're given fishing rights. So that's what they're doing. They're coming in to do some fishing uh, there in the lagoon of Madro. Now, this is landing in Madro. The picture on the left is a picture from the plane. 
As you see, if you notice that blue body of water, that is the ocean. That's how close it was. You're landing in the middle of the ocean. They actually had some rain that day, so you see the water kind of there by the trees or by the bushes. That's from the rain. And the picture on the right is their airport, as you would want to call an airport. Uh, I don't know how many people it holds, but when I got ready to leave, it was jam-packed. It's what you call open air. Uh, they had a restaurant that was new, and it was actually air conditioning. So after you got checked in, you go inside and wait in the air conditioning. But everyone else who was outside waiting to see if they go on the plane got to wait in the heat. And uh, anyway, when you got to leave, it was just a, a jam-packed uh, place. Well, this was landing in Madro and landing on the, on the airport for me and seeing water that close was a little, <laughs> little bit terrifying. And as I was leaving, uh, they told us that it was high tide, it was agreeing to come in high tide right as we were going to leave. And uh, usually the other in the island will flood, not the island we were on, but nonetheless, I was ready to get, <laughs> to get off when I heard that. But that's the airport. Now this are, these are just some facts about the islands. There's 29 separate what they call atolls in the Marshall Islands containing 1,225 islands. Of uh, the Marshall Islands, the population is about 55,000. Madro holds about 24,000 of those. Uh, the people of the Marshall Islands are predominantly uh, Micronesian in origin, and Madro is the capital of the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands are about seven feet above sea level. They uh, told me that Madro is about six feet above sea level. So either way, it's, it's not very, very much above sea level, obviously. Uh, this, in fact, is the highest, highest point on the island. Uh, the smaller boats would come out underneath the bridge. The larger fishing boats would come in through the lagoon to do their fishing and docking, things like that. Uh, but that's the highest point on the, on the island, and it wasn't really that tall at all, obviously. This is the hotel in Madra where we stayed. On the left is a picture of the room, what they call a, a bungalow of sorts. It was divided, Stacy and I were on one side and someone else is on the other side. And the picture on the right is a picture of the hotel where, where our room is at. It was actually off to the left, separate from, from there, which is kind of good because a lot of nights it would be very loud. There was a dock there nearby, and, and they would have a stage set up, and there would be all kind of little mini concerts going on. So it could get pretty loud. So I was thankful that we weren't actually in that section of, of the hotel there on the right. But that's the hotel there on the right on the upper level and also has a restaurant uh, there as well. Below it, there are some uh, shops uh, in, and things in that. The picture on the left of our room is kind of deceiving. It looks like it's a thatch roof, but it's really not. It's fake. It's some kind of plastic. Now, the next, there's some other pictures of some buildings where it's not, uh, it wasn't the case. It actually was real. Uh, they had a community, community building there where you could rent and, and use it for, for little meetings and things, and it actually had a real uh, thatch roof. Now, I sent a picture of this, or put a picture of this on Facebook showing where we were staying, and someone said that I was, we were living it up when we were over there. But just to show you, looks can be deceiving. Uh, one night, about 11.30, we were there on we got there Saturday, I think about Tuesday or Wednesday, about 11.30, I was getting ready to go to sleep, and I started slapping some bugs on me. And I looked, I looked around, I hopped up, and I told Stacy, there's some bugs in the room. He said, well, you know, whatever, it's fine. And in the islands, he's used to it. He's used to rats. And, but anyway, I turned on the light, and this is what we got to see, some flying. You can't really see it here, but you can in this one. We had some flying termites that came in through uh, the wood frame in the, uh, around in part of the hotel room we were at. It's actually right above my head, so that's why they, they came out. Uh, they had a short life, thankfully. They died about 10 minutes later, but they allowed us to switch rooms so they could come in and clean up and spray and everything else. But uh, looks can be <laughs> deceiving. But it was, it was a standard room that uh, was nice once we got to switch to a room that wasn't covered in termites. Now, this is, and again, a picture of the, of the hotel. Then if you were to come out of our room and look across the street, this is what you see on the right. You have uh, a supermarket and... Uh, you could keep going down the street. There actually, I've never seen so many supermarkets in my life. They're everywhere. Now, some are small and some are a lot larger. But when it's 85 degrees and the, and the supermarket is not air conditioned, you shop very quickly. And we got pretty uh, acquainted with doing that, shopping quickly. Uh, but that is what you would see. This is one of the uh, supermarkets there. 
Now this is one of our experiences in Madro. This that's Stacy, and in the blue, there's one of the security guys there from the hotel. I didn't really ask why they needed security. I was just glad he was there. But we were getting ready to, we were waiting for our, our ride to come. And in the islands, you get used to what you call the island time. You tell someone, yeah, let's go ahead and leave here at 9 o'clock. Well, don't worry about it. You're not going to leave to about 9.30, 9.45 when they actually show up. So while we were waiting, this is one of the security guards walking by, and Stacy had asked him if we could get a coconut. They were asking if, if uh, anyone still climbed trees to get coconuts, and uh, he wanted to climb the tree. So he's going to get down a coconut, and I'll, I'll start this. He, he was smiling here a minute. We'll see some pictures. He, he's hitting it with, with a rod. And what is he doing now is he's going to cut open the coconut. This is normally people would take it and it would take off the husk and everything, but he's just going to chop into it. And uh, we found out later this really wasn't the way you want to do it. Some of the other islanders show us, showed us a better way. Uh, but keep your eye on the coconut. You see, he got sprayed. Uh, so that's why that's not the way you do it. Uh, I was told, of course, the last night I was there, that what you want to do is you want to take the husk off, and at our little farewell thing they had for us, they had some coconuts that were in ice with the husk taken off. And he, one of the members showed me that you actually, it kind of has a cone shape on one end. You just break that cone piece off, and there's a little spot you push in. It's about the size of any of your pinky, and you can drink it right out of that. Uh, so that's really not the way uh, to do it. But that's how our security guard did it, and Stacy got sprayed. Now this is what he did. He would cut it off, then he cut a little hole in it, and, and we would drink out of that. Now if you had actually taken the husk off, the other part of the coconut that had the little cone shape would leak out coconut water, and that's why you didn't want to hit it anywhere else, because you'd just be leaking everywhere. But that's the coconut, and that's Stacy not taking a, taking a drink. This was actually a very small one, it would probably fill up the size of a, a solo cup of, of coconut water. And if you like coconut, you would have liked it. I really didn't care for it. Actually, this one I found out a couple hours later. You notice how green it is. It wasn't very mature. And then I found out later that's why it hurt my stomach so much. Uh, but we had coconut on two other occasions where they were more mature and, and it didn't bother me. But that's us trying our, our coconuts. And of course, Stacy has had a lot more of those uh, than I have. Now this gentleman here in the video, he's going to, he has already hushed the coconut and they have cut it in half. What he's going to do, he's going to take the meat out of the coconut. Uh, actually, also, this is one of the gentlemen we studied with later on in the week. He was, he's a member of the church, but he had departed, wasn't coming faithfully, and we sat down and studied with him. And he actually repented and started coming to our Bible classes and to worship while we were there. Well, this is before uh, we had a chance to study with him. He's going to He's sitting on a box, and it's got a little blade on it, and you're going to see him. He's going to take all the meat out of the coconut. That's Stacy talking, explaining what he's doing. But there was another young man 
uh, just to the right of him, he had a long steel pole really in the ground, had a point on it, and there's no way I would have done what he was doing. He was taking the coconut and very quickly jabbing it on there and doing it two or three times and pulling the, pulling the coconut right out. A lot braver than I would have been. And then that gentleman took one and he was showing us how they took the meat out of it. Now these are some of the sites you would see in Madro. What's on the left is a picture of a bus stop and you see there on the side it says provided by Madro Atoll local government uh, Mayor Mudge Samuel that says with funding from the government of Japan 2002 and that's an example of some of the things they would do they'd get funds and they'd build uh, these bus stops because there's buses throughout and there's taxis everywhere and then they would trade use that and trade for uh, fishing rights also on the right is a picture of really what it, it's a it's a water catch uh, they had outside of every home had one of these and yes that is the gutter coming down into that. They would use the water from the rain and they would take that and use it for cooking or whatever it was they were, they were going to use it for bathing, things such as that. So we were lucky. I never had to mess with anything like that. We had uh, clean water there at the hotel. But this is what the Islanders would use. And you had these at every home. If you just come right off the gutter and into these tanks. Again, uh, paid for by the government, given to, uh, the funds given to them from uh, Japan. This is actually outside uh, of the home of one of the gentlemen we studied with that we'll look at in just a moment. This is a memorial that was there on the island. This is on the far end of the island. It's a war memorial for uh, during World War II. And you have on the left, it has it in Marshallese, and it has it in uh, J Japanese, and it has it in English. And it says, in memory of all those who sacrificed their lives on the islands and seas of the East Pacific during World War II and in dedication to world peace. And has, uh, has on there when it was constructed. Of course, it was much, much later. But the memorial had a lot of these stones. You see on the right, it has all these little round stones everywhere. Then on the left, it has some other, this other area of concrete that was round, had these other placements. And there was no sign explaining it, so I have no idea what any of that stuff was representing, but it's just one of the memorials they had there uh, on the island. And this is another one. This is a memorial for the victims of the typhoon that killed uh, a lot of people in, in 1905. Uh, I forget how many people it killed. But that was the worst storm they've had. I was told that usually what happens when a storm comes through or a hurricane comes through is that as it gets, it begins closer to the islands and it doesn't get a lot stronger until it actually gets past the Marshall Islands. So what it hits them is not the strongest storm. When it leaves them and starts going towards the Philippines, that's where it gets a lot stronger. So they have been uh, fortunate since then not to have uh, bad storms that would hit the island directly. This is the church in Madro. Uh, there's a picture of the building there on the left, a uh, concrete building. It's been there 10 years. I didn't know how long it had been there. I had to ask about how long it's been there. So it's pretty new, really. But it's a concrete building. You go inside, and there's some pictures here in a moment. Uh, wooden pews and, and fans and things. No air conditioning or anything like that. Uh, their contribution will not allow for anything like that at all. Uh, when we got there, they had their previous contribution up on the board, and it was around $35 in the previous week. So obviously, their funds are used mainly, uh, as you can see a little bit in the picture, and we'll show it later, uh, put, to put gas in that van they use to pick up their members and use to go door knocking and to, to, for outreach. So that's where a lot of their funds go to. A uh, picture on the right is a picture of the sign. Uh, Yokwe is simply meaning welcome. It actually has several meanings, and I have a brochure that talks about some phrases you can use. And Yokwe can mean hello, uh, goodbye, love, all kinds of different things. So one word has a lot of different meanings, but here it's used in the form of welcome. And that's, so that's the church building uh, and their sign there. And this is actually kind of in behind what they call the local government police stations, kind of back inside among all the houses. And this, there's Danny there on the, or excuse me, Stacy there on the left, and that's Danny Jim. He's one of the men uh, there at the congregation. He traveled with us everywhere. Most of the islanders do speak English, but for those who speak Marshallese, he would translate for us, so he went with us everywhere we went. Visiting, uh, having Bible studies, he drove the van for us, which was an experience. I've never been so scared in my life. <laughs> I kept flinching every time he pulled in somewhere. He pulled in close, and and, and uh, he could be a New York cab 
cab driver because he scared me to death. But he drove us around everywhere and he translated for us on Sunday mornings during a worship hour and translated for us on Sunday evenings. During the weeknight, everyone who was there could understand English, so he didn't have to, he didn't have to translate, which gave him a break because during the day when we went out to our Bible studies, he'd be translating for us all the time. So he, he got a pretty hefty uh, workout. And of course, like I said before, uh, most of the people on the island are very poor. He was working for a school, and then one of the brethren came over there years ago before Stacy got there and had encouraged him to work full time with the church. And they agreed to support him for, for a while. And so he quit his school job and started working full time. Well, now when we got there, we found out he's on his last month of support. And he has no job. He can't, you know, he can't get back into the school system because there's so many people looking for jobs. And when something opens up, you know, someone else takes it. So he's been using that time to work with the church. His wife is still working with the school. And he's been working with the church. And he went with us, like I said, everywhere. He doesn't you know, sit at home. He works uh, uh, very hard for the church. And it was very evident of that. So while we were out working and, and doing Bible classes and things, uh, whenever he would allow us, we take him with us to lunch because in the islands, the people would have, you know, their diet consists mostly of rice. They might get meat uh, one time. And because they eat rice so much, there's a lot of people who are diabetic on the island. So with him working with us, we decided we're going to take him with us to lunch if he'll allow us to do so. Well, he let us just a few times. He won't let us take him to lunch every day and to buy him a sandwich or something. But when he did, we, we took the opportunity to do so because uh, it would be a treat for him and he definitely deserved it working with us there on the island. This is our van that we use. And below that, you see the gas prices range from 560 to 660 a gallon on the island. Where we were at, it was 560. But if you got stuck out on the far side of the island, you're gonna pay a dollar more. And it wasn't but just you know a few miles difference. But that's how much it jumped up. Uh, the prices change on everything from one store to the next. Uh, I found that out when Stacy and I went shopping for our groceries. We tried to eat as much as we could at the hotel and not eat out all the time. And we'd go to a, to a, to a store and buy, I'll uh, say a loaf of bread or something. It'd be three dollars here, and a store just 50 feet away it could be four or five. Well, all their bread is made fresh. There's no preservatives, and it only lasts a few days. So you made sure you spent as little as you could because the bread wasn't going to last a week or two or three days, and your bread's getting moldy. So the prices changed a lot, and the gas was just outrageous. You can see why all their funds would go to the gas for their van, and of course, the van was vital because that's how a lot of members got to services because not everyone could afford to take, take a taxi or take a cab to the church building and to do Bible studies. Not everyone could afford to do that. So the van was used every day, all, all day long, basically. And while we were there, we were driving along and Stacy and I were there with him. Uh, Danny was in the front and Danny and I were in the front and Stacy was in the back. And we kept hearing this clunk as we were going over the bumps. And Stacy said, well, what is that sound? And Denny said, well, that's the universal joint. It's going out. Well, if you know anything about cars, if that goes out, you're not going anywhere. So we decided to help them get that fixed while we were there. Because if it goes out, the van couldn't run, and then a lot of members couldn't get the services. So we were able to help them with that as well, because uh, we use that van all the time. Well, that was our gospel chariot uh, for the week. These are some of the works we did while we, were out, while we were on the island. We had private Bible studies uh, every day, if not with one person, with a different person. We, had, we did some visiting and study with unfaithful members. I mentioned before the gentleman who was cutting, taking the meat out of the coconut. Uh, we studied with him, and he was willing to repent and come back and start attending faithfully. Uh, we got to visit the sick, or try to visit the sick. Uh, we visited the hospital there on Madurell. I didn't take any pictures of that. Uh, I didn't have my take, have it out with me. Uh, but I was glad that we got to gather, gather quickly. I've uh, never been to the hospital like that before. You can picture the states, well, take away the air conditioning, take away all the, you know, half the cleanliness, and there you get closer to what it is on the, on the islands. So pretty uh, scary, actually. But we did do some visiting of the sick. We distributed Bible tracts uh, several times a week, not every day, because we had Bible studies a lot of times in the afternoon. But we distributed Bible tracts uh, almost every day, three or four times a week while we were there. Uh, we signed people up for Bible, uh, Bible correspondence courses, teaching and preaching on Sundays, and then teaching the PIBC Bible classes each uh, weeknight from 7 to 9 p.m. 
Now our study, our schedule looks something like this, unless someone couldn't have a study and we use that time to go visit someone else, then this is what our schedule usually look like. Around 10 o'clock, would actually begin our Bible study with Titus and Nayla, and we have some pictures here in a second. 10 o'clock, we were supposed to leave our hotel at 9 o'clock. Again, island time, we didn't get there till 10, so you just do what you can with them. And then we'd have a Bible, a Bible study with Titus and Nayla from about 10 to 11.30, and then we'd go over to study with Pete at the church building from 12 to 1, and then we'd have lunch around 1.30 or 2.00. And then we would distribute Bible tracts and Bible correspondence courses in the, in the afternoon. We'd have supper sometime around 5.30. And then the band would pick us up around 6.30. And then we'd go to the church building and have our Bible classes uh, there in the evening. The classes that we taught, and we have some other pictures here in a moment. Uh, this is the book that I use, the Pentateuch, by Robert Martin. He is the director of the uh, PIBC Bible College. Uh, and then Stacy used his own book on Christian Evanses. That's what he taught uh, the second hour. And I'll, you can look at these after, uh, after the report if you want to look at some of those things that are in there. Obviously, in two weeks' time, you can't cover the Pentateuch, the five, first five books of the Bible, as it was just really an overview of those books. Uh, but they got to learn, you know, the... Uh, you know the, the writer of the Bible, the three divisions of the uh, or three divisions of the, of the book, the writer of the book, some lessons from the from the book, things like, such as that. So they had a, an overview of each book uh, from Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then Stacy would teach uh, the Christian evidences after I finished. This is uh, working with again working with the church, signing up for correspondence courses. What I have in my arm is actually a, a branch off a coconut tree. Stacy told me when he first got there that when he, if you're out walking somewhere, have a rock with you because there's dogs everywhere and they can, not all of them, but some of them will come up after you. Well, he was walking out one morning and he realized as he threw a rock at a dog, the dog kept coming. He told me later, rocks don't work, you need something bigger. Well, luckily for him, someone on the Islander, Islanders were there nearby, had a crowbar, and as soon as he lifted the crowbar, the dark dog took off. So that next time we went out, I found that and carried it with me. And it's just, again, a branch off of, of a coconut tree. And it was <laughs> really tough. And uh, some dogs would come up, see that, and just walk away. But we're, we're out passing our Bible tracks here. And there's actually three people, uh, the two ladies there on the left and the lady in the doorway there, are signing up for the correspondence course. Over in the islands, if you say, would you like a free Bible track, the answer is always yes. When they hear the word free, they'll take it. Uh, they have been sold a lot of things by denominational people. You will come over there and distribute things at a fee. Uh, the Mormon church is real big there on the island. Uh, they have, uh, if you remember the Mormon church on the island, they will help with funeral costs for someone who, who, who dies. They'll actually buy the casket and do other funeral costs like that for their members. So they have a lot of members. Uh, the Baptist church and the uh, Pentecostal church and others will all have a school there on the island. So a lot of islanders will be members of that denomination because of their school. So there's a lot of that type of thing going on uh, there on the island. So, but so when you say you have a free Bible track, there's no charge, there's no collection taking up, well, they'll take it and they'll start reading right there. And you tell them about a free Bible correspondence course so they can mail to you, and then you mail it back and send them a new one every, each time. They're on board. Within ten to two weeks we were there, I think we signed up close to 30 people on Bible correspondence course. Well, if you've ever been a door knocking around here or anywhere in the States, you know that would be insane to do in a two-week period to have that many people sign up or to pass out that many tracks. So it's a lot different in the islands. They're willing to listen and to, to look at what you're, what you're handing out. This is Nayla on the left, and then Titus, and then that's Danny, our translator. And you remember we mentioned this morning the three girls who came to our study. This, these are the three girls who came. Uh, Titus is actually Danny's uncle or something. He's related to Danny somehow. And then Nayla is Titus's wife, and she actually has been attending the Muslim church. And while we were studying with them, she began, as we found out later, that after we would leave, she would start asking Titus a bunch of questions. So finally, one of the times we were there, Titus spoke up and said, do you have any questions talking to her? And she said no. And he kind of spilled the beans and said, well, she has all these questions after you leave. 
Uh, but he asked a lot of questions. It, it was interesting that he picked up on the idea of how a lot of these donations were using things like schools and paying for funeral costs and things like that to attract people. And when we studied with him, he was, he was on the ball. He was asking uh, very good questions. And uh, when we left, they, we had just finished talking about, uh, or when I left, they had just finished talking about in their study worship. Uh, studying about worship and getting into salvation was the next one. And asking, you know, we were asking questions throughout the study, and he was right there with us. So I'm anxious to hear, about, hear back from Stacy, who just got back yesterday, uh, how the study went after I left. But they were very, very interested. And then the three girls, as I said before, just kind of came in the study and listened. Uh, later the next day, they didn't come back, but another man came in. His name was Sober. You don't forget a name like that. <laughs> Sober. He came in, he sat down for three different days. He came in and listened to the Bible study. He never said anything, never had, had any questions, but he came in every day at the same time, knowing we'd be there, and sit down, he would listen. Now, that kind of stuff doesn't happen in the States. So when you see people doing that, and hearing, seeing their interests and hearing them asking questions like Nayla and Titus did, you know, that's very encouraging. It keeps you going and uh, really gets you encouraged while you're doing those studies. This is uh, Pete here on the left, and there's Danny and myself having our study. We would meet at the church building. Uh, the last day I was there on Friday, I wasn't feeling well, and we were having a study. Well, that day he brought four of his friends with him. Uh, one of them left in the middle of our study, but the other three stayed for the entire hour listening to what we were talking about. And I, I think that day him and I were talking about uh, worship, I, I believe. I'm not sure if that's the last day there or not. But he brought three or four of his friends with him, and, and three, of the, three of the four stayed and listened for the entire hour while we were talking. And we were explaining, uh, we were explaining the differences, the Old Testament, New Testament, that's what it was. And we were talk, got to talking about the Sabbath day. Uh, there's a lot of people there who, who are Seventh-day Adventists, and they believe they should worship on Saturday. And we talked about how the, how the Bible says, you know, on the first day of the week, they were gathered together and worshiping, and that just blew him away. And at the end of the study, he said, I never heard anyone explain that to me from the Bible like that, and I understand now what you're saying. And so if you hear those kinds of responses all the time in your studies, in your Bible classes. So they were very eager and very, very interested in what the Bible had to say. And he, he studied with us every day uh, while we were there, or every weekday, I should say. And he actually came to a couple, he came to worship that last Sunday that I was there, uh, that last Sunday, uh, I don't remember what day it was. He came for that Sunday worship, a Sunday evening. And so very encouraging to see that, and hopefully it ended well. Well, that's one, of, that's one of the two studies that we had when we were there. This is their farewell. And I was asking Danny to send me the words to what they were singing, because uh, it's all in Marshallese. I was trying to record this from my tablet while I was sitting down. Well, they had a meal there. This is on um, Thursday night, because I'd leave on Friday, uh, Friday evening. And they had a table set up, and we had a meal. Uh, we had... Uh, some rice balls that were covered in coconut, and we had some boiled chicken and some other things, and of course we had coconut. And this was at the end, he, they told me, that they set up a table and said, we want you to sit here. And I've never been more awkward in my life sitting there as they're singing this song, and they start walking around here in a moment, you'll see. And I, he's supposed to send me the words to it. When he does, I'll print those out for you. But this is Wilson, who's on the ukulele. And uh, he's the one that explained to me how to use, how to open up the coconut <laughs> correctly. But he did it the last night I was there. But I'll play this for you. You'll see, you'll see them walking around. You'll hear them singing. And towards the end, they start they have a table there and they start laying down some things they were giving me as we were leaving.
this is the last part of it. They started out just sitting down playing, and I stopped it, and then I stood up and started walking around, so I started it again. But this is how they did their farewell, and Stacy <laughs> knew of what they were going to be doing, and he, I asked him what, what they're about to do. He said, well, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. So I was very a little uncomfortable sitting up there while they were doing all that. Well, that's how they do their farewell, and he's been through that uh, before. You may have saw him. He was there on the edge, high-fiving people as they were walking by. Uh, but this was on Thursday evening, and this is uh, during the PWC Bible class. You notice a number of people walking around. That wasn't everybody who was even there. There were actually about 30 people enrolled in the Bible courses. We had given, had given them my test on the Pentateuch that evening, and all but just three or four passed, which is, I think, one of the highest numbers they've had. Because in the islands, you know, the education level and things like that at the time people have to study isn't always what it should be. So to have that many people pass out of 25 or 30 who took the test uh, was very good. So we were thankful for that. But the people in Montreal there, the, the, the islanders there and, and the church there are doing uh, really all they can. There's, uh, there's congregations, as I mentioned before, they're in Chuuk and some other islands there that Stacy will be going to, and there's another island, and I don't remember the name, that Danny, as I showed, showed you earlier, who was our translator, will be going to as well. He goes to some of the other islands as he can afford to and helps them and, and teaches classes or do, does whatever he can to help them out, help out the smaller congregations. So he's going just really everywhere. But the people there in Madro were very interested in what we had to say. And all the times we were passing out tracts and trying to set up studies, there were maybe just a handful of times where people said no or walked away from you. And most of the time, they would stand there and they would listen to you for as long as you wanted to talk. You, you know, hand out your Bible tracts on what is the Church of Christ, you know, what is the Church of the Bible. You show them the Bible Correspondence Course and invite them to enroll for free, and you had them. They were ready to do it, and so many of them signed up. So we, I encourage us to keep them uh, in our prayers, the church there in Madro by the Danny uh, Jim, and also, and I, we, he walked by here earlier. There's another brother named, by the name of Eldon who after he finished the following week, after he finished the, the course on Christian evidences, he is now a graduate of PIBC. He has finished all the courses. Uh, Danny is only lacking just a few, and so many of them have, have taken or have completed all the courses. So they are eager to, to, to do that, to learn more about God, and you know they're there all, all the time, doing all they can uh, to reach out, and they're doing their own uh, door knocking campaigns as well around their building or in other places along whenever they have you know, you know the time and the funds to do those types of things they're doing all that so I encourage us to keep them uh, in our prayers it was a very uh, favorable trip very encouraging uh, for me and very encouraging for them as we had the studies and, and help the brother uh, to see he needed to repent and come back to the church which he did having the Bible studies which I really hope will ultimately uh, end up with uh, baptisms. I'd kind of be surprised if, if they don't, really, because of how well they went. And numerous other contacts that were made while we were there and, and some that we were able to talk to uh, that they had arranged beforehand. Uh, just a lot of folks who were interested in seeing, you know, just letting the Bible speak really is all we did. As the song we sang before uh, the report began, uh, ring the message out. That's really what we strive to do while we were over there, getting the, just getting the Bible out. And when we, when we would sit down and talk with someone or when we stood with someone on the street passing out these tracts, we would simply tell them all it's, all it's doing is talking about the Bible. We're allowing the Bible verses to explain, you know, the Bible teaching. And they were hooked because they would hear a lot of these ideas from other men. And there's another uh, world religion called Baha or Baha'i uh, it was over there. It was very big as well, uh, teaching a lot of things, of course, foreign of what the Bible teaches. So when you when you had a few moments to talk to them about the Bible, they would ask you a question there on the street as you're passing out these things. Uh, you know, they were all ears to hear it. So it was a very encouraging trip, and I encourage us to keep them in our prayers as as they're going uh, every day to do the best they can to spread the word uh, throughout their area, and no doubt being where they're at and having the limited funds that they have, it's going to be very difficult for them. So we need to keep them 
in our prayers. Well, that is our trip. Well, that was my trip, uh, really, in a nutshell. There's some other things that happened. It was just interesting on the flight over, uh, flying with Islanders and things like that. Uh, but I didn't get sick while I was there, too bad. <laughs> and, and nothing crazy happened when we were there, so it was a pretty uh, safe trip, especially when I wasn't in the van with Danny driving. Uh, it was a very safe and a very encouraging trip, so I encourage us to keep them in our prayers. Now, before we close this evening, are there any questions about Madro or the church in Madro or the work that was uh, done there? I believe uh, Brother Stacy plans to go in the summer. I want to say he's going to go to Chuk. This is how you pronounce it. Uh, his wife is going with him because she'll be on summer break from off from teaching, so she'll be going with him uh, over there. And he goes to different islands every time he goes. I think he said this is the first time he's been to Madro uh, in about five years. So a lot of things had changed for him uh, before he was going over there. What about the salary, especially of this uh, man that lost his job from the school? And, and uh, is he having support from him? No, uh, he was asking Stacy and I about that while we were over there. Uh, the congregation that was supporting him uh, was out of Alabama, and they had agreed to supporting at the time, I think $1,500 a month. Was the last couple months have kind of dropped it down each time. The last month was only $500. So, of course, when you take that much, you know, $1,000 difference every time, uh, it really adds up. But I, I want to say that his contribution or his, uh, uh, what he's receiving from the, from the, congregation there in Alabama was about $1,500 a month, and uh, he'll be losing all that. He's been trying to get back on the school or get on somewhere else. His wife is teaching at, this, at a different elementary, but being in the islands, teaching at school, you know, school teachers don't make a lot of money anyway, especially being in the islands, they're not making a whole lot anyway, so he's, they're going to be struggling a lot uh, with that, so uh, he'll be missing about $1,500 a month, the best that I know, so... Uh, I know he was asking about, he was talking to Stacy about trying to uh, make some contacts. Uh, we encouraged him to talk with a brother from Alabama. He kind of put him in the pickle that he's in and encouraged him to quit. Because when you're in the islands and you have a job, you really don't want to give it up. You know, you want to work part-time on the side of the church because if you quit your job completely, like Brother Danny is going through, you may never get it back. Uh, there's actually... Uh, Stacy told me there's uh, around 20 or so people a day that are trying to leave Madro and go to the States for work because there's nothing on the islands. You know, unless you're working in a restaurant or working on the docks, there's very little there. And if you want to make any money at, at all, you really want to be on the docks or in the school system. So uh, it's very tough for them being over. There's a lot of folks who are just kind of walking around because there's no work <laughs> for them to do. So, uh, which was good for us, more chance to Bible studies, but it was, it was bad for them. And that uh, gardens and things of that nature. Some of them do. Uh, I didn't see very big ones because most of the island is, is sand. The widest point is only about three quarters of a mile wide, and uh, so they don't have a lot of space for uh, gardening on Madro. On some other islands, they may have uh, better space, but wasn't I didn't see much there on the island. You saw a lot of coconut trees and uh, and some other uh, fruit trees as well, but uh, you didn't see much of anything else there on the island as far as farming. Most of it was in uh, fishing or in the dock service, working in the docks. Uh, Danny uh, was telling me about one of his last fishing experiences uh, where he was out spear fishing. As I said before, they only have meat about once a week. And one of the ways they would do that would be going out by fishing. Well, he was out fishing, and let me just back this up here. And if you notice on the island, you see the white all around the island, the waves. That's where the reef would stop. And once you get past the reef, the ocean was about a seven mile drop. Well, he was out fishing around the reef and <laughs> not the brightest idea, he kept the fish that he caught around his waist on a rope. And he's in water up to his waist or up past his waist. Well, you know what's out by the reef? Sharks. Well, he's out spear fishing, and he says he felt something that felt like sandpaper going across his back. 
and was a shark grabbing a fish off his waist. And I don't think he's been fishing since then. Uh, so that, I mean, that's the kind of stuff they have to do to get meat because meat in stores are so expensive. I mean, you just, you got to either, either you have the money or you don't eat meat or you take <laughs> some chances. And that was one of the times he, he did that. But I'm not sure he does that anymore. But uh, there's not much, there's just not much room on the island for any type of, of growth because you get too far and it turns into to crushed rock and, and then to sand. Is there anything else? Okay, then at this time we'll ask whether Doyle is in our invitation song. This is not a something obviously would cause all of, any of us to uh, repent or anything, but we want to encourage everyone to keep the congregation of Madro in your prayers. And uh, I actually will be keeping in contact with Brother Danny. I have his email, and I plan to send him some some publications and things. And of course, it'll take several weeks for it to get over there being in the islands. Uh, but we want to keep them in our prayers and encourage them any way that we can.